Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, to this session organized by the Brazilian Mission to the WTO with two very distinguished speakers. First, I would like to introduce you to Ambassador Alexandre Parola, who is the permanent representative of Brazil to the WTO and to other economic organizations in Geneva since October 2018. Second, I'd like to introduce you to Gary Huffbauer, uh, who is a non resident fellow, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute of International Economics and who has written extensively for the past decades on international trade, investment and tax issues. The focus of this session will be on the Brazilian experience with plurilaterals, and especially on the present experience with the government procurement agreement, and why WTO members should focus on plurilateralism as a valuable alternative to multilateralism. On May 18, 2020, this year, Brazil reversed its long-standing policy of non-participation in plurilateral agreements and submitted its application to join the Government Procurement Agreement, the GPA. This decision, the first by a Latin American country where the GPA is concerned, reflected a complex internal decision-making process incorporating changing perspectives from the private sector, the government's anti-corruption efforts, and its objective of creating a competitive and transparent public market in Brazil. Brazil believes plurilateral agreements may offer positive path forward uh, for the negotiation pillar of negotiating pillar of the WTO. So this session will present both the lessons learned from Brazil's journey and lay down, lay out a vision uh, for how plurilaterals could set the foundations for a renewed WTO in the future. So from now on, I will start to pose some questions we already prepared for our speakers, but I would like you to all, please feel free to type your questions under the Q&A chat box and we will have around 30 minutes at the end of the session to answer uh, to your answers, to, to your questions. So to start our conversation after this brief, brief introduction, I would like to first ask to Ambassador Parola about the Brazil uh, recently, recent experience with the GPA. So Brazil, recently applied to join the government procurement ag agreement in 2020. So I'd like to, to ask the ambassador to share with the audience why Brazil decided to join the agreement and what are some of the lessons learned from this process? Ambassador Parola, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, Renata. Let me congratulate you. Congratulate uh, Dr. Gary Hofbauer for, for this uh, debate. And also let me congratulate you for the Women Inside Trade. It's a wonderful initiative, very, very welcome, very relevant and important. Congrats, well done. Well, you, you, your question is very pertinent. And uh, let me begin by something. I have notes, but I will speak from my heart. <laughs> I, uh, you, you touched upon an issue that is very important, is uh, why we didn't, do, we didn't do this before. Now, why are we joining plurilaterals? Well, because the world changed and because Brazil changed as well. So I, I think it's a sign of wisdom to be able to to be in synchrony with new times with new demands. And that's what's behind the decision to join or to seek, uh, I mean, to become a full member of the GPA. The decision, as you mentioned, was formalized in May. And now we're doing, as you know, the process, there is uh, just some steps. Uh, essentially, the first two steps are a checklist. What we have in our legislation that is compatible with the GPA, that's the first part, part of the, the checklist. The second thing is the offer, the, the, the initial offer. We need to bring to the table the initial offer. And we're doing that. Uh, that's the homework we're doing. The checklist, we expect it to be ready very soon, uh, sooner than we expected, which is very good news. And we should bring to this table rather sooner than later. And then the negotiations begin. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. We think it's going to be a very important step. 
As you said, we are the first Latin American economy to do that. We are big economy, so it makes sense to be there. And the reasons are multiple. Uh, one of the reasons is that it has become very clear in Brazil, and uh, it has the, the support of the electorate. Uh, it has, uh, it's one of the, 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 the central tenets of uh, President Bolsonaro's economic policy, is that we need to be more integrated. We need to be more competitive. We need to be more efficient. And GPA offers that. Uh, it's a huge market. Well, I don't know how long I have in my reply. So if I'm taking too long, please stop me or make a sign like. <laughs> Go ahead. You have around 10 minutes. Don't okay, worry. Okay. Thank you. So uh, it, it makes sense to join the GPA. It's a huge market. It's more $1.8 trillion. I mean, to stay outside the market of this size, um, it would be hard to explain. It would be hard to explain. And, one needs to bear in mind two things. It's not only that we will open our markets to foreign companies, but also foreign markets will be open to our companies. And let's face it, we're very competitive in many instances of government procurement. We can fight competitively for uh, procurements in, in many places in the world. So I think it's a win-win situation. We, for us, it's good because it brings more efficiency. It uh, makes sure that the, the, the taxpayers' money is well uh, invested, is well spent, and also it creates, it generates a scale and opens many opportunities for Brazilian companies. So that, that decision was taken, and then we are implementing it. So, and we're looking forward to that. We, we're very optimistic about, I don't know if you want to hear me about the plurilaterals in general, or should we focus on the GPA first? No, actually, I think may, maybe building up on the, your first answer, um, because as we mentioned, Brazil is the first Latin America country to join the GPA. So there is a sense of demonstrative effect for the region also, I believe. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, some, an outsider, uh, an academic, so I, I'm very happy and pleased with the decision of Brazil to join the GPA. I think it's a very important decision because we are a big, a big country here, big economy. There is a demonstrative effect. So maybe oh, building up on that, Ambassador, uh, I would like to ask you to further comment on where or what were Brazilian reservations with plurilaterals before, what has changed, and why are we focusing this session on this, on this option of plurilaterals? So maybe we can, we can, I would like to hear a little bit from you about that, and then we can uh, listen a little bit to Gary, who has been advocating for that for many years, for more than a decade. Ambassador? Well, it's something called the inevitable force of reality. No, reality has a weight. I mean, you, you can fight reality as long as you want, but there's a price for doing that. And I think we need to reframe the problems. Uh, for a long time, the options were either multilateral or nothing, because plurilateral is, is, is a betrayal of multilateral. So if you want the multilateral way, you take the high road of the multilateral way, so you should not compromise. You should not go for the plurilaterals. So many economies or many countries took the decision of uh, choosing nothing. The problem of choosing nothing is that you get exactly what you chose, nothing. <laughs> so it, at the end of the day, it's a lose-lose situation. It preserves the status quo. It doesn't make your economy more integrated. It doesn't preserve your theoretical policy space. It doesn't make you more competitive. It just consolidates a given distribution of power and a given distribution of wealth. So I think that the, the reasoning uh, became more and more clear that it was high time to revisit those, those premises. And looking at things very concretely and very pragmatic, see, well, what is that for us? Is there, are there gains to be obtained in a plurilateral negotiation? Yes, there are, and the GPA is a good example. So the, the, the request access for the GPA is a clear demonstration of that. But there are other demonstrations of that. I can give you a few examples, for instance, we have been very committed in the e-commerce negotiations. It's a plurilateral. We have been very committed in investment facilitation. It's also plurilateral. I, it's very interesting. Last year, uh, when none of us had heard about COVID, we had a huge, a big debate here at the WTO, and I was 
ahead of the privilege and the responsibility and the honor to present a position about investment facilitation. And the member of the audience very critically said, but how can you do that? How can you be in favor of investment facilitation? My answer was straightforward. So, well, because the opposite of being in favor of investment facilitation is being in favor of investment difficultation, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense. And it's investment facilitation for development. So how can you be against that? It's a matter of having clarity of concepts. In investment facilitation, we not we are not, it's very important that this is clear, we're not negotiating investment treaties. We negotiate with investment facilitation. I mean, to be against that, it's very hard for me to understand. And the same goes in general for plurilaterals. Uh, there are some realities that are evident. It's been a long time uh, without any major substantive result properly multilateral within the WTO. We have the Trade Facilitation Agreement. Ambassador Roberto Azevedo was crucial to obtain this result. I mean, his leadership was essential. Uh, his absence is felt here. It's going to be very difficult to replace someone of his caliber. And then with all his abilities, his qualities, he could achieve with the membership, the trade facilitation agreement, and not much else. So maybe we should leave the door open for plurilaterals. I guess that's the future of this organization, because the, the alternative of having plurilaterals here, if we close the door in the WTO for plurilaterals, we need to be very re realistic. We're not going to kill the plurilaterals. They're going to happen somewhere else. So if, if, for me, it's not a good decision. I prefer to have them here under the umbrella of a multilateral system. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. It does, it does. And I completely agree with you. I think uh, uh, there is a consensus uh, that a reform of the multilateral trading system is required. We have a consensus on that. Uh, so maybe plurilaterals are, are the best option. I don't know if they are the only option available. So I'd like to ask maybe Gary to build a little bit on that. Uh, uh, do you do you think that we need a consensus, Gary, um, to open to plurilateralism? Uh, is this the only option we have right now? What, what are your thoughts? I know you have been writing and talking about that for many, many years. So I'd like to hear a little bit your perspective on this. <laughs> well, thank you, Bernardo. Uh, first of all, I really, uh, want to congratulate Brazil and I want to congratulate the ambassador for putting forward the case for plurilaterals so well. I mean, it's just a marvelous, uh, I would say, breakthrough, not only for Brazil, but actually for the whole uh, world system that, that Brazil is taking uh, a leadership role here as it has in so many other aspects of the trading system. And as the ambassador said, reality has a way of crowding in on a doctrine. And here's the, here's the very sharp divide. In the Uruguay round, we had the single undertaking or single understanding, the notion that everything would be agreed by all the countries. Well, that was then. And then we, we the world, tried to launch the uh, Doha round, and you know the story there as well as I do. The world has changed, as the ambassador said. It's very hard to get 164 countries, that's the current number in the WTO, to agree on whether they're gonna have scrambled eggs or boiled eggs for breakfast. And anything more difficult is virtually impossible. So really, to directly answer your question, Renata, the only way forward on negotiation is through the plurilateral approach at this time. Maybe the reality will change in another decade, but that's the reality we're living with here and now. And I think uh, the, the ambassador mentioned uh, the very able Director General Acevedo. He was caught in this, you know, shift of, of mode. And as the ambassador said, the one multilateral agreement he could get through in, in, in 2013 with great 
personal effort was the trade facilitation agreement. And even that, which is kind of common sense, we had one major country, India, holding out after it had been agreed for a year or two to wrap up an issue on, on a stockpiling. And that was it, so far as the multilateral system went. And meanwhile, there were these efforts to start new agreements, particularly the trade and services agreement, TISA. Uh, it was not exactly embraced by the WTO, but kind of a little bit of a distant relationship. And as the ambassador has now said, there are several other plurilateral agreements now being discussed. I would put primary emphasis, as, as he said, on the um, electronic commerce. I could talk about that more. But there's also the fisheries, and as he said, the um, as the ambassador said, the uh, uh, investment facilitation agreement, which does not mean investment access. It means once a country has decided it's going to let investment from abroad in a certain sector, then it, you know, it makes it easy. It cuts down on the paperwork and so forth. That's very sensible. Uh, not to take too much time, but let me just say one more thing about the government procurement agreement. I especially welcome Brazil's initiative because in the United States, unfortunately, we are in a very nationalistic position on trade generally, and alas, government procurement particularly. And it comes under this label of Buy America or Made in America, which both, both President Trump and Vice President Biden have just embraced that Made in America is the next thing to mom and apple pie. Uh, we have put a, um, a, a, a blog on our website, the Peterson Institute website, which just shows the cost of this foolishness. It, 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 I'll just give one statistic because I think it's an arresting statistic. In the United States, made in America or by America, whichever label you want to use, cost, cost the taxpayers $250,000 per job save in this industry. It doesn't create jobs in the economy, but in the procurement industry, yes, it maybe keeps more jobs, but 250,000, the median household income today is about 70,000. I mean, this is ridiculous. And, uh, I'm so ha and so it's a great gift to your own taxpayers to open up procurement to foreign suppliers, as the ambassador said more efficiency and so forth. I've talked too long, let me stop. Thank you very much. No, excellent remarks. And actually, maybe we, we would like to listen to you more about this bipartisan trade agenda that applies both to, it doesn't depend on the next president of the United States will be, but uh, I'll leave this to the end if we have time. Uh, so to both uh, speakers, I'd like to ask both the ambassador and, and Gary, uh, to help me think about the broader consequences of the, for the WTO. Like, what are the practical steps that uh, WTO members can take toward harnessing plurilaterals as a path forward for WTO renewal? So if you can help me think about that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who would like to begin, maybe the ambassador? Yeah, by all means, thank you. Well, that, that, that's the $1 million question, isn't it? It is very difficult. Let me just share some thoughts about this. Uh, I mean, uh, Professor Gary mentioned dogma versus reality. But uh, let, let me talk, I, I won't use the word dogma. Let's say uh, long-held views, let, let, let me call it. Those long-held views about multilateralism, views which oppose multilateralism to nothing, so I'd rather have nothing than having something in the middle. They're not neutral. It's very important to bear this in mind. They, all, they follow uh, a very strategic understanding of national interest on the part of those who sustain those views, because they represent a clearly obstruction of the system. 
So there are members, and I won't name here, uh, you, you fill in the blanks, for whom it's better that nothing happens now, that, that something happens maybe in 15 years. So stopping plurilaterals, it's very really good. Because while I don't have plurilaterals and while not much happens in the multilateral arena, my subsidies uh, go up, my, the industries which I'm subsidizing go up, the, the tariffs that I'm using to protect my economy are going up. So uh, the thing is, it's not like a, a, a choice that is only theoretical, only abstract, or only academic, for lack of a better word. No, 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 no. Those choices, they reflect interests. So uh, from this point of view, that, that's why I think it's so important to bring to the table another possibility, which is natural. So the question you ask is, how do we bring this to the table? And then, as I said, that's the $1 million question. And let me just give you a, a, an attempt of answer. Uh, all the candidates to the post of DG now are committed to some form of new space for plurilaterals. They know, they, deep down they know this is part of the reform that this institution needs. And let me also clarify something. I don't think the WTO risks extinction. I think that the major risk we might face is irrelevance. That's what we should be worried about. We won't go away, the buildings will be here, a wonderful technical staff will be here, the secretariat will be here, but nobody will pay too much attention to, to the things we do because the major decisions will be taken somewhere else. I think this is something that I, I think that should be avoided. So how do we uh, open the space, that's the expression I've been using, to plurilaterals? It begins with distinctions. I think that the, the first distinction is the distinction between two words, either in English or in Portuguese, consensus and unanimity. They, they're not the same. They're not perfect synonyms. We take decisions by consensus here, and uh, we, we have associated this to unanimity. On the basis of unanimity, we need to be realistic. Well, not much is going to happen. Because whichever vested interest is jeopardized by any single negotiation, if it's power enough, we take it. And that's the reality we have been living for more than a decade now. So how do we bring this to the table again? Let's try to revisit those understandings. Let's try to make the WTO more accessible to plurilaterals. And let's try to redefine the shape of the WTO. We need to be more flexible. We need to be able to accommodate variable speeds. We need to be able to have variable speeds under a, a truly multilateral umbrella. The truly normative, which I would call the, the constitutional level, this has to be multilateral. I cannot have rules that apply only for me, not for you, no. But under the multilateral uh, constitutional framework, it doesn't exist, I'm creating this expression here, we could have uh, different uh, possibilities of arrangement, but all covered by the multilateral and open to other members to converge to that. I think that offers a, a good future to the WTO, and I hope we are able to embark along the lines of constructing, constructing this future. But thank you again for your question. Excellent comments. And Gary, would you like to react to the ambassador's comments and make your own remarks on that? <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, I'm so delighted by listening to the ambassador that uh, <clears throat> I want him to stay there in Geneva and uh, and preach the message because he's a wonderful expositor of what I would regard as um, absolutely the correct views. Let me now uh, just dip down into some important details. <clears throat> uh, the, the ambassador didn't mention, but Brazil is one of, I think, it's about 20 countries which belong to the so-called multi-party interim uh, appeal <laughs> agreement. It's a big, a big mouthful. What it is, it's an alternative to the um, appellate body, which the U.S. has put out of business by refusing to name new members. So this multi-party agreement is arbitration between the 20 or so countries which have joined, of which Brazil is one. So congratulations to Brazil. This is very important plurilateral because this um, restores a, a dispute settlement mechanism, at least for those countries. Now, as a matter of regret, 
the U.S. has opposed, the U.S. doesn't belong to it, but it's in, it, it has opposed the multi-party interim agreement being associated with the WTO. I mean, th this is a very bad precedent that the U.S. has established under the current administration because what we really want is more uh, plurilateral agreements to be under the WTO umbrella, as the ambassador said, not reject. The one, the one is the, an important one, which is, is right there right now. There's another detail I want to touch on uh, once we have these plurilaterals going, uh, <clears throat> that um, <clears throat> will be very important, and that's to have a common dispute settlement mechanism for them. Uh, if you go back to the Tokyo round, and I know that's a long time ago, um, but we had several Tokyo round codes, and each of them had their own dispute settlement. Not very satisfactory. That was all brought together in the Uruguay round to have the single, <clears throat> single undertaking and the, the dispute settlement mechanism a crown by the appellate body. Well, for these plurilaterals going forward, we ought to do the same. And uh, this multi-party interim agreement can be, at least for a time, for many countries, the dispute settlement, which will be common to all the uh, countries which at least belong to the multi-party interim agreement. Let me just do one other, I think, important detail on these plurilaterals and the dispute side. The, the, the important element, which is, is part of the government procurement agreement, is that when there's a dispute between two members, the, uh, the uh, retaliation, the compensatory measures have to stay within that agreement. So in the government procurement agreement, if one country does not honor <clears throat> its obligations to um, open up a certain market, another country can withdraw the opening of, a, of one of its markets to the offending country. But it can't go off and put on some tariffs or uh, deny some intellectual property. I think that's very important because if these plurilaterals have different country components, uh, they really ought to keep the, uh, well, we could say the countermeasures within that, that group. I know that sounds a bit on the weeds, but this is a group uh, who's listening to this, I think, which is probably a very experienced group. There's much else that could be said, but let me, let me stop there with those, um, with those thoughts. No, excellent remarks. We actually we are receiving some questions and I encourage people to keep sending because we're going to have time to address them by, uh, by then. Uh, I would like to maybe maybe following up to this previous questions I made for you um, and thinking about rebuting the WTO through plurilateralism. So let's go one step further. Uh, what should be the goals of this uh, new trading system in a broader perspective? Uh, I don't know if Gary would like to start or the ambassador. I leave it to you. Please, ambassador? Prof no, professor, professor, yeah? please. Gary? So Gary. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, the goal is to get as much, in my view, is to get as much liberalization as possible consistent with uh, social norms. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's just take this um, e-commerce negotiation, which is underway. Uh, there are quite a few countries in it. I think the uh, ambassador can correct me, but I think it's almost uh, 70 or 80 countries in the negotiation. Uh, but many of them don't agree to some pretty basic elements like 
data flows. You know, can data freely flow across borders through the internet? Uh, what about um, uh, what about uh, copyright protection on the internet and so forth? The members of e-commerce seem to agree on a few basic issues like electronic signatures, uh, scamming, not having scamming, uh, and a few other uh, basic areas. Well, what might happen is that of the 80 or so countries which are part of the um, negotiation, some of them will be able to agree on a, on a whole range of issues. But some, uh, let me just name one important country uh, area, um, Europe might have a very different privacy standard than the United States. So maybe as between some members, uh, like the US, uh, Canada, North America, uh, North America generally, possibly Brazil, there can be agreement on flows of personal data. But maybe Europe won't agree on that. Well, we can get some agreement that's better than no agreement, and the plurilateral can have uh, tiered agreements for, for different members. So I've just focused in on, on e-commerce. What about fisheries? Well, countries are very divided about how much subsidy they can provide to their fishing fleets. And there is a, a common problem of overfishing of the ocean. But maybe some countries can agree to cut back on these subsidies, which are leading to overfishing. Well, that's that's better than, than nothing. Uh, it's a start going forward. And, and you can go forward to investment facilitation. The ambassador mentioned, well, maybe some countries feel that making any agreement on investment is against, against their interest. Other countries, Brazil might be an example, would say, okay, we're not going to open up every sector of the economy to foreign investment, but we are going to open up certain sectors where we think foreign investment is useful. And for those, we're going to cut back on the bureaucratic red tape. That's what investment facilitation comes to, cut back on the opportunity for just hassling firms or, you know, getting small bribes or whatever. So these are all steps forward. You know, maybe it's not as great as having one grand agreement which covers everything all at the same time, but that grand agreement is not going to happen in this decade. So let's go for what we can get. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Ambassador? Well, th thank you very much. Uh... Well, I agree with, with much that was said. Uh, let me just try to to look at your question from another perspective. Is uh, our plurilaterals part of the rebuilding of the uh, Are plurilaterals the only thing that is necessary to rebuild? No, by no means. I think that we have reached a point in time and uh, in the the way we see the WTO and the way we leave the negotiations and the successful, su successful, uh, I mean, obstructions and blockages on the way, that uh, we need to go back to the, to the origins. And I think it's time to ask very clearly the question, do we believe that trade generates prosperity and development or not? This question has to be answered because this question was present in the beginning of this organization, in the early days. I mean, if you look at the Atlantic chart, if you look at the need report that led to the early days of the GATT, if you look at the GATT days, if you look at all the Kennedy round, Tokyo round, even the Uruguay round, there was a, a, a common theme. And the theme was that, yes, trade is good. Trade generates prosperity, trade generates wealth, trade generates uh, uh, shared growth, and trade is a very efficient tool in fighting poverty. If we look at the performance of the economies that have emerged during the last 30, 40 years, none of them has been successful without opening itself to trade. This simply didn't happen. So we need to recapture this idea. It's almost like we need 
to revisit the founding uh, fact. So if we don't believe that trade is good for development, then there's something fundamentally wrong with the WTO. Because you will be coming to the table trying to make sure that nothing happens. Because say, no, no, trade is not good. I need to preserve my economy from trade because trade is evil. And then once I'm big enough to join the trade gang, I will do it. If that's the, 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 the mind frame, the point of view, then I, I will be very pessimistic. But I think that uh, once we have a new DG, next year we're going to have a ministerial conference. I think that one of the main points of the reform will be to reassess the principles. Do we believe in those principles or not? I, I think that without that, it will be very difficult to move on. So, and the plurilaterals, there will be an answer to that. So they're not, those things are not dissociated. They're a part of a general package. And I'm very glad that Professor Hofbauer mentioned the, the Tokyo round. If you look at the Tokyo round, uh, it offered many positive things. It had its problems, of course, but it offered many good things. One of the things was flexibility. If you look at the codes of the Tokyo round and we look at the covert agreements of the WTO, I mean, they pretty much the same. The, there are differences, of course, we can visit the differences, but the ideas are there. So maybe it's time to recapture this flexibility and plurilaterals would be a way to recapture flexibilities. We can begin in negotiating, for instance, a code on fisheries. That's just an example. This is not on the table now, but why not turn plurilaterals into codes and see the, the speeds at which we can evolve? I think that would bring a lot of countries to the negotiating table. And most of all, we need to understand that uh, strengthening the WTO is strengthening a, a very important tool in the fight against poverty. Let's not buy the myth or the version according to which trade is only good for the rich. It's not. This is not true. But thank you. Excellent, excellent remarks by both of you. And uh, I, I, I completely agree that, well, at least from my perspective, the WTO remains immensely relevant, but we have a major risk of irrelevance, like the ambassador said a few minutes ago. So just, I have a final question from my own, and then we have several questions in the chat box already. So uh, uh, before we open to the questions from, from the audience, I would like to hear from you and thinking about the relevance of the organization and keeping it relevant, what are some areas where plurilaterals may offer a chance for the WTO membership concretely and usefully progress issues? So we can be creative here. So maybe Gary touched upon it a little bit. Uh, so if you want to start, Gary, and, and then we, we end with the ambassador and we go uh, to, to get some questions from the audience. So Gary? <laughs> Well, that's a good question, Renato. I, I, you know, I'm very bullish on the uh, potential areas of uh, <coughs> where where the WTO could move forward through plurilaterals. In fact, uh, uh, almost any topic. Let's take one one area which is, I think, very important to many people, and that's climate change. Um, assuming that, that uh, Vice President Biden becomes president <clears throat> um, next year, uh, almost certainly the U.S. will rejoin the Paris Accord. I mean, it didn't ever formally leave, but it will come back in an energetic way. And the Paris Accord uh, will hopefully uh, get countries to agree on overall limits to their emissions and coming down on their emissions. And, and President Xi of China said, well, they'll get to carbon neutrality by 2060. That, that was quite a statement. Um, but this is a very welcome statement. Okay, if you look at carbon emissions generally, about three quarters of them are involved in activities which really don't participate very much in international trade, for example, transportation uh, and power. 
Uh, about one quarter are involved uh, well in industrial say. goods and agricultural goods, okay. which do get involved in trade. Well, I think here's a, a, an area for the for the WTO to consider. Are we going to set up a whole set of new kind of carbon taxes on that one quarter? Are we going to have some broad umbrella agreements on what our countries commit to in the overall emissions package? Well, that's that's a good subject for discussion, and that's really a WTO uh, subject uh, 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 that can take from the, from the Paris Accord the broad objectives and then go down into how it gets enforced. There's, there's, that's, that's a big one. Okay, what about emissions package? What about labor? That's that's an important issue. And obviously the U.S. and other countries are concerned about improper labor practices in some countries. Well, what, you know, kind of what are the appropriate labor standards? Is it the ILO? You know, the five declarations in the ILO which are now embodied in, the, in, in, uh, in some trade agreements in the USMCA countries. We have the ILO and other other accords as well with Peru and some other countries. Well, you know, is that the right way? Well, that's a, that's a good uh, subject for the... Uh, the WTO to decide, and maybe there will be a group of countries who all subscribe to the ILO fundamental principles and rights of work. And body that agreement. So I've talked about two social things, but then let's come back to, you know, kind of uh, good old uh, uh, trade issues. Uh, uh, let me start and get in the weeds, but that's where the, uh, that's, that's where the negotiations are. So what about sanitary and phytosanitary issues on a range of agricultural products and meats? This is extremely important because this is where... You know, trade is stopped by sometimes real and sometimes bogus sanitary and phytosanitary standards. It's a big problem for agriculture, and Brazil knows this well because it's been the victim of these kind of measures by the United States and other countries as well. Well, I think that's an area where, you know, not all countries... But many countries could agree on, you know, what, what constitutes sound science, what are appropriate sanitary and phytosanitary standards. So there's just a, just a rich array, and I think the question is issues where you get a significant number of countries, let's say at least 20, hopefully more, maybe 50, maybe 80 countries to agree that it's worth having a uh, you know, try to get a negotiation and set up some new rules, which hopefully are in a liberalizing direction on, on those issues. So it's, it could be a, it could be a very productive town where countries, you know, let's say at least 20, hopefully more. And uh, you made me uh, remember uh, last year at the public, WTO Public Forum, former Apple Body member uh, J uh, James Bacchus and also your colleague Jeffrey Schott, they mentioned that there is no WTO without addressing climate uh, change issues in the future. So you made me think of that, and I remember both are very, very uh, uh, vocal on that. So, Ambassador, your remarks? Well, thank you, Renato. Thanks for your question. I will just benefit from the last comments by Professor Hoffman about the SPS. I think that's one area that is right. We need, I think, I'm convinced that we need to move forward on that, because that's a real, real challenge. Uh, that's the, one of the more the names of protectionism, it's SPS. It's not tariffs, it's not quotas, it's SPS. Because if, if we allow the economies to adopt SPS metric without the necessary scientific background, anything goes. Because you can say, well, my minimum residue is now at zero. And nobody produces at zero level, and uh, there's no proof there is uh, uh, dangerous for anybody's health, anything beyond zero, but, but you just close your economy, uh, you close your markets, and then, you, and then until you, you're able to fight the bureaucracy involved in that, 
you, you just kill the supply chain. So it's very difficult. We, <coughs> I, I'm convinced that SPS is one of the areas in which we, do, we would hugely benefit from having a structural plurilateral uh, discussion. You just close your economy. You close your market. Well, thank you again. Able to yeah, I completely to agree. Possible. So I'd like now to um, start addressing the questions from the audience because we have several. Uh, the first one I have here is from uh, Valeria Mendes Costas, also also a Brazilian diplomat. Uh, and, and Valeria actually uh, asked um, two questions. Uh, the yeah, first agree, so is like what is the um, risk of a WTO a la carte the and the if there is any? Several. And if there is, uh, if the there are risks, how can they be uh, overcome? So I don't know, Ambassador, if you'd like to, to go first, uh, and, and actually, oh, I'll, 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 I'll leave it free for both of you to choose, uh, choose the, yeah, the questions you'd like to address. Okay. But, oh, oh, I'm sorry, what exactly is the question? The risks? The question, if, the, if, if, there risks, uh, if there are risks, if we agree that there are risks for a WTO a la carte, like the gas times maybe, if there are risks, risks uh, can those risks be overcome under your perspective? Yeah. I will ask for the indulgence of the members to quote uh, a Brazilian author, Kimarães Rosa, who says that viver é muito perigoso. Well, there's always risks. Being alive is dangerous. Uh, so we need the, the I mean, we should not aim for something that is completely riskless or zero risk. Uh, I mean, diplomatic and political decisions is about balancing costs and balancing opportunities and balancing risks. What are the risks of nothing happening? What are the risks of having a system that does not work and that slowly fades away in the irrelevance? They're not small. We need a normative system. And it's not because of a, a, a theoretical attachment to the multilateral system as if it were a value in itself. No. It's the, the multilateral possibilities that preserve the defense of national interests. So the plurilaterals, I am convinced. That it is a tool in this way. So we should look at those things very pragmatically, concretely, uh, and not, not from a long-held view or with fear of change. We need to understand that not changing also brings risks. So that's how I see the defense of national interests. Perfect. Uh, Gary, would you like to comment? It is a tool in this way. Well, the ambassador has put it very well. And I want to refer to a remark he made Right at the beginning, if we don't have plurilaterals within the WTO framework, we will get the same issues covered in regional trade agreements, such as the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, such as the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement, such as the EU agreements with, it has about 70 partners. So the issues will be covered elsewhere. So that's a downside risk of not having an a la carte or a club of club approach within the WTO. Because what that means is that there are going to be many countries which aren't part of these regional agreements. They're not going to be part of the party. And now to refer to something else the ambassador said at the beginning, but ever so correctly, there are very few examples, if any, of countries which have protected their way to prosperity. There are many examples of countries which have liberalized, sometimes gradually, sometimes more rapidly, and prospered. I mean, striking examples in Asia, in Latin America, <clears throat> around the world of countries which embrace the world markets and, and prosper. Well, if we have if we if we have a kind of a system where many countries have no participation and and, and then don't unilaterally decide to liberalize, there's a that. And to take one further point from the ambassador's remarks, 
on equality. I know there are a lot of people in the United States who think that uh, trade, international trade and investment is a big engine of inequality. I disagree with that in terms of the United States, but more importantly than what the ambassador said is that inequality between nations has been dramatically, and I mean dramatically narrowed since the Second World War because of globalization. This has been the greatest period in human history in terms of reducing inequality of once very poor countries and moving up the ladder. Now, so those are the risks of going, saying goodbye to liberalization and the new frontiers of liberalization in services, electronic, commerce, and so forth. Now, let me just mention two of the risks that some countries feel in this a la carte. They feel, on the one hand, that there'll be clubs coming together which will have, uh, which will set very high standards and then basically force countries which don't want to belong to the clubs to come in according to those standards way up there. So they feel it will be a, a, it'll be a coercive mechanism. I don't agree with that, but that's one, one fear. The, the, the other fear, which is very relevant and is true in the, in the German procurement agreement, that these plurilaterals, many of them may have what technically is called a conditional most favored nation approach, that any country can join, but unless you join, you don't get the benefits. So in government procurement, if you're not part of the government procurement agreement, the country is not entitled to compete. Its countries are not entitled to compete with the government procurement of, of another country. Well, some people feel that's a big departure, and it is a departure from unconditional most favored nation, which is a, a uh, basic principle in the, in the world. But we move beyond that. We don't have unconditional MF in practically anything. We have all these regional agreements and so forth. I mean, that, that is yesterday, not just yesterday, that's 50 years ago. So those are two risks which are voiced and uh, by, by respected people, but I just disagree with those two risks of a a la carte system. And I see a lot of risks of not having an a la carte system. Gary, um, maybe um, th there is another question that closely relates to, to that one, actually. So I, I believe people are really uh, interested in listening to, to you and the ambassador talking a little bit about that. There is one question from Roman Abramov. Uh, who says WTO introduced the single undertaking principle, which intended to combat the foreign shopping approach of 1947 integrants. Before the creation of the WTO, multilateral disciplines were highly fragmented because an only minority of countries were disposed to negotiate and accept new obligations. In this glance, do you believe that the plurilateral approach under WTO could lead the organization to the same end as that 1947 uh, substitution slash irrelevance? If you'd like to comment on that, Gary, and... Well, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Oh, the ambassador. <laughs> well, the ambassador. That's a very short answer, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, well, I, you know, I, I'm going to give a lecture at the Columbia Law School on November 2nd on the single undertaking. So this is a subject which, which I know fairly well, the history and so forth. As I said in my opening remarks, the single undertaking, that's yesterday. It had a, it had a period when it flourished. The period when it flourished was the period of the Quad. That is to say, four countries really dominated the whole WTO system. That was Japan, Canada, the US, and Europe. Well, those days are gone. 
you know, the original GATT had 21 countries and only four or five of them, you know, really dictated things. Well, in that, in that context, you could have a single undertaking. Now, you know, that the quad is, is gone. There, there are at least 20 quite powerful countries in the, in the WTO, and they, they don't agree on all the important issues. <clears throat> The, many many issues which may not be so important. So the, the the questioner is right. We have a fragmentation, but the fragmentation reflects the reality of the world and the fact that there are new players in the world, and the uh, the WTO can't can't change that reality. I agree. Ambassador, would you like to? Yeah, let me elaborate a, a, bit, a bit more about Mayas, and let's go back a bit to history. Let's go back to the 40s, when we had the 1940s, when we had this whole discussion that is at the origin of the, the GATT system and the WTO. I mean, it's very any, any, any person say, well, the U.S. won the war, so they wanted the system in their own image, so it's Bretton Woods. We all know this. But let's look a bit more closely at the debate. What was the, 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 the center of the debate as the WTO, or as the GATT days were being uh, framed or, or designed? It was a debate about, about a multilateral system against the imperial preferences. That's what was at stake then. I mean, it, it, we just go back to history. Because otherwise, if we had emerged from the Second World War and kept the imperial preferences, I hide, I'm very doubtful that we would have the, the growth that we had since World War II. So that corresponded to multilateral trading system. And of course, the disparity of uh, economic development between countries that was much wider than it is now. So it's not that the interests were more unified, it's that they were more, I mean, they had less power. They were, more, they, were, they were less present in the debate. So is the world now more fragmented? Yes, it is. Uh, should we go back to the idea of a single undertaking that freezes everything until we're able to reach unanimity slash consensus? I don't think this is the best idea. I think there are instances of multilateral uh, demands and instances in which we should be flexible to accommodate fragmented is a pejorative word, but uh, different interests. So there's no reason why uh, countries or members uh, should not be able to join agreements within the WTO according to their own interests. And of course, you have, even today, among the 164, you have uh, wide degrees of uh, the difference in development. And for some countries, it doesn't make any sense to, to charge them a price to join those things. Yeah, they should be allowed to join. For, for, for many countries, it should be strict MFN. For some other countries, uh, I think this should be debated. I don't have a personal position, much less an official position on that, but I think there is a very valid point of debate. Uh, let, let's look at those things uh, which are much more nuanced way. And I think that as we do this, again, I will insist, we need to, uh, two, uh, two perspectives. Is, pragmatism and being concrete. Where are my interests? So is being flexible good or not? I think it is. So that, that, that's why I take the stand that I'm taking today. No, oh, excellent. Actually, I have several questions more or less on the same, uh, on the same uh, subject you, you started to mention, actually, Ambassador. Uh, there is, I think, the question from Aluizio Lima Campos kind of uh, uh, of um, summarizes the the the, um, uh, the issues commented in other questions. But uh, Aluizio asks uh, or re makes a remark that one uh, one big weakness of current plurilaterals is free riders. So how could you deal with free riders? or with those who want the benefits of plurilaterals, but not its obligations. So there, there are several questions actually on the, same, uh, on the same topic. Should the benefits of open plurilaterals go to non-members when they do not face the costs 
are restrictions. So uh, if uh, you both could comment on that, I don't know if Ambassador would like to go first now. I, I leave it open to both of you. I can address that briefly. Alois is a good old friend of mine. Uh, I, I, I know him from my whole life and I like him a lot. He's a, an authority. Uh, and then, uh, of course, this is a danger. But I think that beyond the danger of free riders is the danger of people making sure that nothing happens. That does not mean that free rider, free rider is not a problem. It is a problem that has to be addressed. But uh, we need to be very careful about those things because the expression itself, free riders pejorative. And some, to some countries, it just makes sense for them to join to be completely open for them to join, uh, a costless list. So say, okay, please, it's important that the system uh, is broad, is inclusive, and you should be part of that. We believe that trade generates prosperity, so you should be part of that. For some other economies, it makes a bit less sense that, that it, uh, you only get the benefits, but we, you don't contribute. So that, that's why we need to, to, to calibrate, to design very carefully how we build the plurilateral. What does it mean an open plurilateral? It's open to whom, which is the degree of openness. What does it mean to be open? It's open for other members to join. But those things have to be negotiated. I, I just don't think that we should close the door entirely. That, that's essentially my point. It's a very simple point. Gary? Yeah, that's that's a great question from, from Lima Campos, who's a great man. Um, if we go back a little bit in history to the post Uruguay round period, uh, we had uh, several uh, plurilaterals on important issues. There was the uh, basic telephone agreement, but there was the information technology agreement, and uh, one or two others. And the, the feature of those agreements was that they were uncon unconditional MFM, which meant that all countries in the WTO system had the, benefit, had the benefits of the agreements, uh, but there was a large majority of trading interests who signed the agreement, like 80% of the trade and in information technology was covered by the ITA, telecom, uh, the financial services agreement, about the same high percentage. And so when you got percentages as high as that, conditional most favored nation, that is, not allowing free riders was not a big issue because the countries which didn't belong were small trading partners. And so, yeah, they got a free ride, but it wasn't a big deal. Well, we've gone on. Now we're in the issues where, you know, you're not going to get this 80%, 70, 80, 90% of the world uh, trading partners, world exporters, uh, as a member of a single plurilateral agreement. So that really raises the issue, which uh, kind of, uh, stressed of free riders. And that's why they have to be like, any of them have to be like the government procurement agreement, which does not allow free riders. If a country does not, is not a member of the of the government procurement agreement, its companies who might be very well qualified are not entitled to bid on uh, government procurement in, in countries which are members of the of the agreement. So and that's conditional most favored nation, and that will be the most forward in most of the plurilaterals, I think, that are teed up for the next decade. However, I really want to um, highlight a point that Ambassador Perola made, and that is that there are many countries which are, you know, developing countries, small countries, and so forth. It doesn't make any sense to pay the price, as he put it, to, uh, you know, ante up in terms of their own uh, laws and restrictions. 
So give them the benefit of unconditional MFN. But then there are other countries, you know, the, the big, big emerging countries, uh, sometimes called the BRICS, which it's impossible not to have them participate uh, in order to uh, make the agreement go. So there can be some nuance within multilateral agreements as to countries are subject to the conditional MFN features and those which are not. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and there is there is one question that I find it interesting because we can again exercise creativity a little bit. Uh, so uh, there is uh, this question is from Fiona Angelis, uh, and she asks if the panelists could name some key components that you believe should be developed in this framework necessary to embrace plurilaterals within the WTO. Um, would you like to continue, yes, maybe, yes, Ambassador? No, Professor, Professor. Professor Gary. I, I would say the Ambassador is much better informed on what, what can go and what won't work in the WTO system, but let me just toss out a couple of ideas. One, I do think there should be a common dispute settlement mechanism, as I mentioned. And I understand now the appellate body is dysfunctional because of the U.S. position. You know, we'll have a new president. Maybe the U.S. position will change. We'll rescue the old appellate body. If not, we have this multilateral, multi-party interim agreement, which maybe we'll get more members. So uh, to handle the disputes, I really think it's important to have a, a single dispute settlement body. <clears throat> Uh, secondly, I think it's important that there be some minimum level of countries, either in terms of country numbers or percentage of trade, before you start talking about a plurilateral agreement. In other words, I don't think five countries, uh, five medium-sized countries ought to be able to establish a plurilateral. If they want, they can establish a regional trade agreement but maybe some threshold in terms of the uh, minimum number of, of countries would be reasonable. And finally, I think any plurilateral agreement should be open to all WTO members if they want to sign up. In other words, it shouldn't be a closed club. Maybe there are conditions, but in principle, any country could join. That's my short list. Ambassador, would you like to comment? Yeah, essentially, I agree. I think I, I'm convinced that things such as inclusive, inclusiveness and transparency, they are fundamental and they are overreaching, mm -hmm. essential to the system. I think this is very important. Uh, the idea of a, a common, uh, in the sense of overarching also, a dispute settlement mechanism, I think this is very important also. And l let me elaborate about a bit about the MPIA. We are members of the MPIA, but uh, we joined the MPIA understanding that it is or should be a stepping stone towards a revised uh, system. It's not a substitute. Uh, it, it is uh, Article 25 structured and strengthened in a way, but it's based on Article 25, so it's not any, something completely new in the system. Uh, it is by definition plurilateral because it's multi-party, that, that's just another name for the thing. But uh, uh, in no moment have we believed or have we expressed the belief that we think this is a replacement. No, this is a, a stepping stone. And that, that's why we think that in, in the acronym MPIA, the I is very important. It is an interim agreement. It's not a substitute. It's not a new agreement. Uh, it's not a replacement agreement. It's something that is a bit of wait and see. In the, in, in the meantime, we have some legal certainty. We are able to defend our, our claims and our rights. So we think it is important, but are we still working towards uh, a, a common structure? Excellent. Uh, actually, Ambassador, there is one question specifically from uh, to Brazil. I don't know whether you can answer that or not, but basically, uh, Andrea Andrinelli is uh, asking, what are the prospects of Brazil joining other existing plurilaterals, such as the Information Technology Agreement? 
Uh, it could be very difficult for me to say this decision yeah. comes from the capital, so but I cannot elaborate on that. We members of many of them uh, already. It's like MISMIS, which is uh, small, medium-sized, micro, small, medium-sized uh, enterprises. Uh, we're very engaged in commerce. We're very engaged in investment facilitation. So we we part of the of the of the game of the negotiations. Okay, perfect. Um, Gary, I'd like to pose this next question to you, maybe. Um, uh, Rudolf is asking: Isn't it necessary to distinguish between closed multilaterals like the GPA in Annex Four? of the WTO agreement and open plurilaterals, MFN-based, modeled uh, on the fourth and fifth protocols of GAT, to GATS. Would you like to answer to that? Yes, yes, that is an important distinction. And I, I, I would welcome open plurilaterals wherever they can be agreed. Um, you know, that, that, that is better because that's closer to you know, this notion of a single system for all countries. Um, it won't be possible in every area, but 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 they should be welcome. An area where I, I, I would hope we can get an open uh, plurilateral would be in the climate uh, change. We'll get a, since so many countries belong to the Paris Accord and the implementing features uh, might be carried over for all these countries into the WTO. Uh, so that's that's one area, and I'm sure there are others as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And uh, there, there is one question, interesting question from India, I guess. Uh, and the question is the following. Um, um, plurilateralism is a function of geographic identity and historical imperatives. So the RCEP is not the same as Mercosur. Speaking about India, for several reasons, India could not develop its core competencies in areas like dairy, manufacturing, etc. Can't opening up be very selective? Isn't it feasible uh, that some countries follow the multilateral framework and achieve its objectives? Who would like to go first for that? Professor, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah. I think you're muted, Gary. Yeah. Do you want me to go first? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's a big question. Yeah. Since it comes from India, and since I'm not an ambassador, I can be more candid than possibly Ambassador Paul. <laughs> um, I, years ago, I, I was a technical advisor in, in India and Pakistan. So I know a little of you, and I love you. What has really struck me over these decades, and this is decades ago, is how well China has done and how less well India has done. Not that India hasn't done better, but China has done much better. And what is a huge difference between China and India? Well, I think China didn't have as many advantages as India did to begin with, because India had English language, which is a very important advantage, and had contacts with Europe and so forth. But India, for a long period of time, as Jagdish Bhagwati, very eminent economist, and Ann Kruger and others have pointed out, followed very protectionist policies, and its trade ratios to GDP are very low. And I think that's a big handicap for India. Now, that's a long-winded way of now coming maybe closer to the question. What is India's comparative advantage today? Services, e-commerce. India is doing well in these areas, and it can do much better. I mean, Bangalore is a terrific uh, intellectual center for all things electronic, internet, and all, in all styles, and finance as well. Well, this is an area where India should be leading the, you know, the liberalization services and e-commerce. That's India's strength. I don't see India out there doing 
this, this kind of leadership, which is so much in its national interest. I mean, decades ago, I remember reviewing a book by an Indian author who really wanted to be very protectionist on services for India. Well, maybe, I don't know what, what the author was thinking then, but that, that makes no sense today. Now, it's true, maybe India cannot be liberal on dairy, but there are areas where it could be much more liberal, and I would certainly urge uh, uh, India's commercial leadership to, you know, to take more of an outward, uh, forward-looking approach in those areas. Excellent. Um, Ambassador, would you like to comment on that, or? Well, thank you. <clears throat> that was a very interesting question. Uh, I must confess that it's not clear to me the relationship between the discussion about plurilaterals and Mercosur. Uh, I, I didn't get this part of the question. Uh, about being selective, no, it's about being specific in the defense of your national interests. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, uh, the, the definition of where your interests are, it depends on each sovereign country, on each sovereign nation. Uh, I'm not going to make the argument in one direction or the other, because it's perfectly possible to argue that uh, being close is the best thing that can happen to you. Yeah. Then the, the problem then is, uh, what is the function of the WTO in this reasoning? Is it to protect your economy or not? So I, I, I'm not saying anything in favor or against, I'm just trying to organize the argument and see where the distinctions lie. So that's a bit how I answer uh, the question and uh, the question you, you brought to me. So excellent. We have um, five, 10 minutes. Um, I think I covered all the questions in the Q&A chat box, but I have one last question from my own because since I have the privilege of being moderating you too, I would like to, to make um, a broader question. So if we agree here in this session that plurilaterals are the answer, I would like to ask uh, to both of you if, if the WTO system can remain uh, relevant without big players, for instance, the US. Can, can we move forward without the big players? Um, I don't know who'd like to go first. Maybe Gary, because I, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, again, you know, I, it's easier for me to comment because I'm not a, as you say, a politician or an ambassador. I'm expecting a change of leadership in the United States. Um, on November 3rd, and um, I, I don't expect uh, President Biden to put trade as his top agenda. And there are so many domestic issues in the U.S. which will take precedence. But I do think that within a year, he will be much more engaged on trade in a very different direction than the current uh, U.S. administration. And <clears throat> I think the worst thing that could, ha could happen would be a continuation of, you know, U.S. isolationist policies, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, essentially withdrawing from, from active participation in the WTO and instead making so many issues of bilateral issues, obviously with China, but also with the EU and maybe with other parts of the world as well. Um, so that would be very unfortunate. I think even if that were to happen, even if my forecast is wrong, the WTO can certainly go forward, not as robustly, but it can go forward without U.S. participation. Because after all, U.S. is now about uh, a fifth of the world economy. So you miss that fifth, but you have the other four fifths, which can go forward. And there's a lot of productive things that the other four fifths can do, uh, unfortunate, but uh, that, might, that might turn out to be the reality. But I do think it's going to be a, a coming together after uh, this election. 
Excellent. Thank you, Gary. And then uh, I'd like to leave this eight final minutes we have before, I don't know if Ambassador Gary would like to make a final remarks to close our session. Ambassador? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity. Those debates are very important and they are part of the, the common effort of fighting irrelevance. We need to bring this debate to the public arena. The decisions taken here, they have an impact on people's lives. They're not to be made by specialists in closed rooms because they matter. So it's very important uh, that you organize that, that we participate, that you listen to criticisms, that we may be able to offer our views on things. So my final words will be words of uh, thanking you very much. Gary? I'm in total agreement, Renata. Thank you for, for moderating this session and thanks to the ambassador for such an excellent presentation and for bringing really, I think, quite good news from Brazil in terms of its, its, uh, its, its new policies, its reversal of, of historic policies in such a constructive direction. Thank you. Um, and from, from my end, I'd like to thank you both for such an uh, engaging discussion, for, for being open to answer to all the questions we received. This is a very, very important moment. I think it's an important session. Ambassador, thank you for being so open and thank you for your leadership uh, in Geneva with those issues. Gary, it was a pleasure to virtually meet you. And thank you everyone that was connected with us until now. Uh, I hope we have other opportunities in the future to further discuss these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.